Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Special welcome to visitors that we have. And I can't remember. Oh, Courtney, I was just introduced and I've forgotten already. Welcome to Courtney and welcome to Paul and Carolyn Mulroney. And we're going to hear from them later on in the service. And I can't see any other visitors. No, all good. And welcome to those joining us online as well. Would you all please stand while Sal brings the scripture in, reminding us that our faith is based on the word of God. And please remain standing because we're going to open with a song, Mighty to Save. woken you up. Please be seated. <laughs> now, this morning the psalm for the day is Psalm 22, and that's said to be the prophetic picture of Christ on the cross. But it can also relate to situations we find ourselves in today, when we feel really down and depressed and everything's going wrong, and we feel far from God. And after reading from five or six different translations, I finally settled on, settled on reading um, from the Passion Translation. So Psalm 22, 1 to 15. My God, my God, why would you abandon me now? Why do you remain distant, refusing to answer my tearful cries in the day and my desperate cries for your help in the night? I can't stop sobbing. Where are you, my God? Yet I know that you are most holy. You are God enthroned, the praise of Israel. Our father's faith was in you. Through the generations they trusted in you, and you came through triumphant. Every time they cried out to you in their despair, you were faithful to deliver them. You didn't disappoint them. But I am like a worm crushed and bleeding crimson, 
treated as less than human. I have been despised and scorned by everyone, mocked by their jeers, despised by their sneers, as all the people poke fun at me, spitting their insults, saying, Is this the one who trusted in God? Let's see if Yahweh will come to rescue you. Let's see how much he delights in him. Lord, you delivered me safely from my mother's womb. You were the one who cared for me ever since I was a baby. Since the day I was born, I've been placed in your custody. You've cradled me through my days, and you've always been my God. So don't leave me now, for trouble is all around me. There's no one to help me. I'm surrounded by many violent foes like bulls. Forces of evil encircle me like the strong bulls of Bashan. Like ravenous, roaring lions tearing their prey, they pour curses from their mouths. Now I'm completely exhausted. Every joint of my body has been pulled apart. My courage has melted away. I'm so thirsty and parched. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And now you lay me in the dust of death. Let us pray. Gracious God, when we cannot see you, you look in compassion upon us. When we cannot speak a word, you hear the sighs of our hearts. When we're falling apart, you hold us together with your grace. Jesus, healing hand of God, you reach out and take away all which distracts us from discipleship. You challenge us to give away everything which keeps us from following you. You surround us with people, even strangers, who enfold us with your love and hope. Loving Spirit, when we are too weary to put one faltering foot in front of the other, you carry us in your strength as we seek to challenge the unfairness of our world. You stand beside us in your justice. When we are afraid to come near, you bear our prayers to the seat of grace. Merciful God, Holy One, hear us as we pray together using the words we have been taught by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory is yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to sing our second song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
please be seated. And now I'd like to ask Caroline to please come up and give us the children's story. So, children, would you like to come up and have a story? Awesome, awesome. Now, at some point, Mr Mulroney's going to have to get through because he's going to help me. So when that happens, but anyway, oh darling, he doesn't want to come. <laughs> now, I'm thinking maybe you guys might be a bit young. Do any of you play sport? What do you play? You play cricket. Wow. Yeah? Basketball and footy. Awesome. Awesome. Now, are there rules? Do you have to know the rule? What? Yeah? So, yeah? <laughs> that is true. If someone's trying to teach you the rules, you need to listen with your ears, don't you? You can come through, darling. Oh, we got the boogers and everything. <laughs> it's great. Come on, darling. You come and join us. So what do you think would happen if you went into a netball game but you started to dribble the, basket, dribble the ball like you do in basketball? Do you think that would work? No. Or if you started hitting the, the cricket ball like a softball, do you think that would work? No. So the rules kind of define the game, don't they? So what would happen, here's a game that, you know, younger ones might have played. Have you played Simon Says? Have you played that game? Yeah. Do you think it would work if we stuck our fingers in our ears? No. Why wouldn't playing Simon Says work if we'd stuck our fingers in our ears? I know, that's well done. You could, because you've got to be able to hear. Yes. So, you know, we have to be, you know, set up right for the game. Well, we're going to try an interesting game here of follow the leader. Now, Mr Mulroney is going to come through. So, I'm your leader here. We're getting ready. I'm not sure how this is going to work because we're a bit crowded in. But is it going to work if I'm hidden behind a cloth? No. no? You don't think you could follow the leader? No. So you, you guys get up and you follow, follow us around. Where, where are we going to go? Are you fo you're not following. Are you going to get up and follow us? Yo, know, do, do your big knees, big knees. Oh, coming around. Are you following the leader? Are you sure you're following the leader? I'm over here. Oh, the wrong, the wrong leader. <laughs> Do you know what? I didn't think I'd be able to trick you. I think I was expecting you'd catch me out. <laughs> so later on, the grown-ups are going to learn about a rich man, and he came to Jesus. The people that, in, that lived with in Jesus' time, they had a lot of rules to follow. And that was all about living a good life and showing how you could love God. And they had a lot of rules to follow. And this man come along, he thought he was on a good wicket here. He thought he was in. And he goes to Jesus, I've followed all all the rules and I've done really good at following the rules and Jesus being who he is he knows that this guy is dinkum 
And it says that Jesus said he loved him because he knew that he had been sincere in trying to follow all the rules. But he knew there was one thing. And he says to this man, really knocked him for six, he says, I want you to sell everything you have and give your money away. And that poor man, he didn't know what to do with that. He said, I can't do that. And what it was for that man, just like you were trying to follow the leader, but you couldn't see the leader, that that man realised he was putting his trust in his riches. And even though he's doing his best to follow God and show how much he loved God, there was something in the way. And so Jesus is always asking us, he says, you know, are you sure? Are you sure that you're following me? And it's something that we have to keep examining. So just like you had to be a little bit more cunning there to see that you were following the leader. And I think with that, that's just... pray. <clears throat> God of infinite patience and wisdom, we come to you with so many things that claim our time, our energy, our resources and our very lives. We are easily drawn away from serving you by the enticements of the world for wealth, ease and comfort. We are owned by our possessions, held captive by our treasures. You continue to offer us healing and hope. You seek to transform our lives from captivity to freedom in witness and service. We look at the world in which there is so much warfare and strife, anger and hatred, and we easily become overwhelmed by the needs and the stresses. Help us to place our lives and our trust in you, knowing that with your help, 
many wonderful things can be accomplished which will provide hope and peace for others and ourselves. Give us courage and strength to truly be your disciples, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to ask Cobus and Rosie to pre please bring us our Bible readings, and that will be followed by Paul Munroney bringing us the message. Right, <clears throat> Job 23, verses 1 to 9. Even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. <clears throat> I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. There is the upright could reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Look, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. And in verse 16 and 17, <coughs> For God made my heart weak, and the Almighty terrifies me, because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness, and he will not hide deep darkness from my face. This is the word of the Lord. And I am reading from Hebrews 4, 12, verse 12 to 16. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's side. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet, with, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may re receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you once again for the opportunity to come and speak. Carol and I consider it an honour and a privilege to be able to share with you today. The church at Langford brings greetings, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I see there's a few new faces here, which is awesome. It's so great to see. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Mulroney and my wife Caroline and I are itinerant pastors for C3 Stand in Langford. Now, our home church is going through a name change at the moment. We used to be C3 Langford, but now we're C3 Stand. And the new name represents that God is calling us to draw a line in the sand and make a stand for God and to be the change that we seek in the community to allow God's transformative power to flow in and through us to the world around us. Because if we don't stand for something, we'll fall for anything. So it's been a really interesting time going through that journey. Three weeks ago, we were in York taking the service. Two weeks ago, I had the privilege of preaching at my home church in Langford. Last week, we were actually at Dreandra at the Name Changes Youth Camp. So that's our, our youth group for our church. And it was really, really cool. The, the theme of the weekend was Level Up. And it was a challenge for the kids to do business with God. And uh, we, we finished with taking the service at Kibelling, and that was a great time. I have never seen so many people in that church which is great because usually it's such a small thing. We doubled it just because the youth kids were there. It's great. But um, next week we're visiting Yangebut Baptist in Perth and in November, Grace City Church. And then in December, we're um, in Northcliffe and also here in Meriden again. 
So four more trips before the end of the year. I mean, we've been really, really busy. But God is good, and we're privileged to be able to come and share like this to encourage the body of Christ in the bush. But many years ago now, I was invited to attend a retreat called The Walk to Emmaus. And I know a few of you guys have, have been on the walk and know what it's all about. And um, at that time, Carol and I were heavily involved in our home church, which was Canning Baptist Fellowship. And I was the worship team leader. We were home group leaders. Um, we were volunteering at Lamplighter Ministries in their counselling area. Um, I was on the board. We had two boys who were all very active. And uh, at the same time, we had a small business writing computer software. Life was very full. And I, you know, all those who are um, young parents, they know what the challenges are of um, having kids and, and trying to juggle all that stuff. But when I got to the Walk to Emmaus, it was a very structured event. And um, it was a bit of a, a, a screech moment as you come to a halt. And the very first night was like, we're going to have a time of silent meditation. It's like, I don't know how I can handle that. It's like a minute here, two minutes. It's like, oh, it's, I've got to be doing something, you know. But, um, yeah, for those who haven't been on the weekend, there's 15 talks. There are five talks on the grace of God. Uh, there's some on Christian living and discipleship. There's uh, three talks around how the life of grace is built on three legs, which is piety, which is giving our heart to God, and study, which is giving our mind to God, and action, which is giving our hands and feet to God. But the very first talk of the weekend is a talk called Priorities. And it's a very interesting talk. Uh, in that talk, we learned that one of the things that sets us apart from the rest of creation is that we have the ability to consciously choose priorities in our life. We have the abilities to decide what is important to us, what has place or preference in terms of our time, money and resources. Priorities can be consciously chosen or they can be unconsciously chosen. That is, if you don't choose a priority, you've still made a choice because to not choose is to make a choice. And we live with the consequences of that. What do I mean? So, for example, if I love chocolate, and I love chocolate, I could choose to make chocolate a priority in my life, right? And people do, right? Yeah. Um, I could eat a lot of chocolate. But the consequence of that is that I'm going to put on a lot of weight, right? True? Yeah? Because those who indulge, bulge, right? It's true. If I choose to sit and watch TV every night and not do anything else, the consequence of that is that I'm not going to achieve much in my home life outside of work. Yeah? If you come and visit our house and you go into our living room, you'll see a bookshelf that is full of sci-fi DVDs because I'm a bit of a sci-fi fan. We've collected every season of Star Trek. It's available on DVD. We've had every season of Stargate. Almost every Marvel movie, so Iron Man and Captain America and Hulk and all, all that sort of stuff. If you looked at that bookshelf, you could say that for me, sci-fi is a priority. Right? I remember years ago there was a quote from NASA that said, for NASA, space is a priority. Now, seeing that NASA is an acronym for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the word space is in their name, so you'd want to expect that it's going to be important to them, yeah? Now, if you change your priorities, you can make changes to the outcome of your life. If you change your priorities, you change some of the outcomes of your life. So, for example, Caroline and I have two beautiful grandchildren, and we want to be able to keep up with them as they grow up, because they're really, really energetic. So for us, Caroline and I, we need to get fit, and so we've made that a priority in our life. So because of that, I'm cycling three days a week now. Caroline's walking every morning. And we're doing these things to lose weight and to gain some stamina and some endurance so that as our grandies grow up, we have the energy to do things like to be able to keep up with them when they're riding their bike and running around the playground and all that sort of stuff. And they are so full of energy. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who's a grandparent can relate to that. You know, they go home and you go back to, you go to sleep. It's like, oh, just <laughs> zonked out. We, uh, it was my oldest granddaughter's birthday party uh, yesterday, so we're there helping set up and, and uh, running around the backyard and just the, the endless energy. If you could tap that, that would be amazing. But, you know, getting started is always hard. When I first started bike riding, um, I thought I'd be doing well to ride 10 k's. But in this last week, I've even ridden over 100 k's so on three, three trips, three rides. So I can tell you, 
from personal experience that change is possible. Change is possible. But I think the most startling thing that I discovered from the talk on priorities is where our priorities are revealed not so much by what we say, but by what we do. Not so much by what we say, but what we do. And these unconscious priorities often take precedence over the ones that we say we have. Do you know what I mean? So, for example, you say one thing, but you do another. And sometimes it's surprising that if someone had asked you if that was a priority, you'd immediately deny it, you know? Are you committed to losing weight? Oh, yes. Uh, well, what's that donut I see in your hand? Um, that's a once-off, really. It's just a fluke. Really? What about yesterday and the day before and the day before that? Hmm. How's that seafood diet? You know, you see food and you eat it, right? Okay. So it's an unconscious thing. It's so true. So how about you? If I asked you what your priorities are in life, what would you say? If we looked at what you do in the day to day, do you think that would line up with what you say? Interesting, isn't it? So if you tell me that you trust in God to supply your needs, do your actions actually back this up? See, we might say that we follow Jesus, but do our actions reflect our words? We say that God is a priority in our lives and that we put God first, but when it comes down to the crunch time, do our actions actually reflect this? And look, these are hard questions. It's very easy to say when everything's going well, oh yes, I love God and I follow him. But our actions really need to back our words. And today in our gospel reading, we're going to look at the story of the rich man and Jesus. And in that reading, we're going to see sometimes our words say one thing, but our actions tell a different story. And in this story, Jesus is calling us to a radical commitment to follow God no matter what. And he starts to unpack that with his disciples and explain what that might involve. So are we ready to get into the word? Great. Before we get started, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we will hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So the reading today in the Gospel is Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And it goes like this. Mark, 17, uh, Mark 10, verses 17 to 31. And as he was starting out on the trip, a man came running up to Jesus, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what should I do to get eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But as for your question, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not testify falsely, do not cheat, honour your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I have obeyed all of these commandments since I was a child. Jesus felt genuine love for this man as he looked at him. You lack only one thing, he told him. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And at this, the man's face fell and he went away sadly because he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for rich people to get into the kingdom of God. And this amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to get into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, the disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Then Peter began to mention all that he and the other disciples had left behind. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. And Jesus replied, I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times over houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and property with persecutions. And in the world to come, they will have eternal life. But many who seem to be important now will be the least important then. And those who are considered least here will be the greatest then. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's break that down bit by bit and see what God has to say. 
So today's passage in Mark is also mirrored in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 30, and Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. If you line those three passages up side by side and read them, you'll see that there are slight differences between them, and that helps us get a different perspective and see a bigger picture. So if you have time during the week, do that, because it's actually really interesting. So we'll go through verse 17. Um, a man came running up to Jesus, knelt down and asked, Good teacher. So in Luke's account, the man is described as a ruler. In Matthew's account, he is described as a young man. Here it says that he just ran up and knelt down to imply that he was respectful um, of Jesus. In other passages, it doesn't say this. But when you read them together, you get this picture of a young man who sees Jesus as a wise man and an authority in the scriptures, but who, who isn't God? And in the Tyndale commentary, it says that Jesus was asking him, in effect, why do you call me good when you don't recognize my deity? So even though in God's, Mark's gospel, Jesus is referred to as a teacher many, many times, this is the only place in the gospel where he is called good teacher. And in the commentaries, they talk about how it's quite an unusual thing to say it like that. Verse 19, Jesus says, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery. And so on. These are straight out of the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 20, verses 12 to 16. Every Jew would know these words. Every child would have been brought up on these words. The story of Moses and the Ten Commandments. They would have memorized them and taken them to heart. Teacher the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a child. So here it is, the man's believing that he's doing okay. He's attained a level of goodness as judged by the standards of the law. And maybe the man was expecting something more of Jesus. Like, well, I've done that, but do I need to do something else? Like there was some kind of challenge that he needed to undertake. Maybe he thought he had to do something difficult and exceptionally meritorious to make good anything that might be lacking in his life. Instead, Jesus says this, verse 21. You lack one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor. Now, Instead of having an extended discussion about what this means to truly keep the commandments, Jesus focused on the specific issue that revealed this man's problem. He lacked one thing, that he loved riches more than he loved God. He loved riches more than he loved God. And in fact, that's breaking the first and most important commandment, Exodus 23. Do not worship any other gods beside me. So here's this guy who says, yeah, I'm following everything. And God, Jesus says, really? How about this? Point to that one point in his life, that ooch ouch moment. Ever had one of those? Where God just uh, puts a finger on it. Entering the kingdom of God requires repentance. And Jesus helps this man understand exactly what repentance entailed for him. He did not need, as he might have thought, to attain a higher level of personal righteousness, but he needed to enter God's kingdom through repentance and wholehearted love for God. He needed to deny himself first, deny himself and love God first and foremost by giving away his money. So verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich people to get enter the kingdom of God. It is, um, how does it go? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. Now I've heard that saying that the eye of the needle was actually a gate or an entryway into Jerusalem. But a lot of the modern commentaries say that isn't correct. There's no such place. Interesting, in the footnote for the Passion Translation, it says that the Aramaic word for camel is the same as rope. So it's possible that the Greek translators have actually misunderstood the original intent. So in the Passion Translation, when you read it, it says it's easier to stuff a rope through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to enter God's kingdom. But rather than get hung up on the saying, we should focus on the understanding that this is like saying something is impossible by using hyperbole, you know, um, like a saying like, oh, when hell freezes over, I'll do this, or pigs might fly. You know, if Jesus was teaching here today, he might say, it's easier for a politician to speak the truth and deliver an election promise than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? Using a modern analogy. Verse 26, the disciples were astounded. They were astounded. Why would Jesus say that? Because the Jews of the day believed that riches were a mark of divine favour. That if you were rich, that somehow you were closer to God. And here's Jesus going, look, this rich guy, he's like way off the mark here. 
right? So once again, Jesus threw them for a loop when he said things like this that went against the popular belief and conventional wisdom. Jesus is reminding them, God's wisdom is not man's wisdom. God's ways are not man's ways. Verse 27, Jesus said, it's... Humanly speaking, it's impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible. In the Meshit's translation, it puts it like this. Verse 27, Jesus was blunt. Not a chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. But every chance in the world if you let God do it. I love the way that says it. It's not up to us. It's up to God. It's the fundamental proposition of the gospel that salvation by one's own efforts is impossible. You can't do it. But by God's grace, people can be saved through faith. And it's a gift of God that money cannot buy. For rich or poor alike, it is a miracle of divine grace. Verse 28. Peter begins to mention all that he and the other disciples have left behind. And I was reading the New Bible commentary around this passage, and it says it like this. In the meantime, Peter's been making some characteristic mental calculations and begins to compare himself and his fellow disciples favorably with the rich man. It's like, oh, that guy, yeah, he's doing the right thing, but we've done more. We've actually given up a whole lot of stuff as well. So that makes us better, right, Jesus? Peter starts to weigh up how he's traveling, as if to make it some kind of bargaining chip with God later on. You know, Jesus, didn't we go over and above for you? Surely that must amount for something, right? But look at Jesus' reply. He says, I assure you, everyone who has given up anything at all will receive now and return a hundred times over. And in the world to come, they will have eternal life. So it's like Jesus isn't going to play this game about wealth and riches and and sacrifice and all this. It isn't about who who has given up the most. It isn't about who is the most righteous, who isn't the one that's followed the law the closest. It's not about what we have done. It's about what God has done. It's not about what we've done. It's about what God has done. God sees and knows that we face stuff, right? And he knows what we've had to overcome to get here. But what is important is this, that those who have given up everything in this world to follow Jesus, in the world to come, they will have eternal life. In the world to come, they will have eternal life. And he goes on to say, but many who seem to be important now will be least important then, and those who are considered least here will be the greatest then. And this is a recurring theme in all of Jesus' teaching, the the upside-down values of the kingdom. So often the world's values are in opposition to the kingdom values. We see this all the time. The Passion Translation footnotes say this, To enter into God's kingdom realm means more than salvation. It implies a participation in its principles and an experience of its power to change our hearts. The principles of God's kingdom are not the principles of the world. Greed is conquered by generosity. Promotion is given to the humble. The power of God's kingdom is found in the Holy Spirit. How interesting. How interesting. Yeah. So following God, becoming a disciple of Jesus, it isn't just about our words and what we do in front of others. It's our heart attitude that reflects in our priorities that we have truly put God above everything else. It's in our heart attitude that reflects in our priorities that we put God truly above everything else. So I can hear you say, Paul, so what? We've talked about chocolate, we've talked about sci-fi, exercise plans, obeying the law and sacrifice, but what does it mean for me? Now, firstly, Jesus is not saying that money is bad. He's not saying money is bad. But let me ask you this question. Do you trust God or do you trust money? Do you trust God or do you trust money? See, it's easy to say that God will provide if you have a stable job, that you have regular income. Money then is just a matter of budgeting and planning and not spending above your means. And, you know, you've got to remember that in Jesus' time, there were rich people supporting Jesus, so he could do what he's doing. And we all need money to survive in this world. Now, what Jesus is saying is that we need to make sure that there are no idols in our life, that there is anything that we would put above God. And just like the rich man who came to Jesus and claimed to have followed the law to the letter and yet still had money put above God, We need to make sure that our words line up with our deeds and that God is truly the highest priority in our life. 
Jesus is challenging us to make sure that our actions line up with our words. What we say needs to agree with what we do. We don't live by the world's standards, but we live by God's standards. God looks at the heart, so we need to make sure that we know what's in our heart and ready to deal with whatever's in there so that the final result is pure devotion to God and God alone. See, if we were in the same possession of the rich man and we came to Jesus and Jesus said, we said to him, we've obeyed all of your commandments, God, what would Jesus ask us to do? Would Jesus ask us to give up something? What would that be? See, as part of our discipleship walk with God, there's a process where we need to keep dealing with the stuff, dealing with the hidden desires of our heart. We need to take these things, these unconscious priorities that are hidden, we need to bring them into God's presence, give them to God, and then take that bold step and put God first. Then we will be free to follow God with all of our heart. Now, what do you think that kind of faith might look like? Well, let me tell you a story. You know that Carol and I, we run a small business. We write uh, software. We've got database systems. God provided us for us when we started time and time again. In the early days, um, when we were first starting out, jobs would turn up just at the right time and we, we give us work. And when a bill came in, a check would come in for a client at the same time for the same amount. It was uncanny the way that God provided for us right on the moment. And as we grew, we got more regular work and larger jobs and more people working for us, greater pressure for wages. And uh, about a year ago, things were really, really tight and we were really struggling to get cash um, for our business. And I found that for me, it put me right on the edge that every time a client asked us to do something, I was stressing about getting that job done as quickly as possible. And it was like, what do I need to do right now for you to pay us today? And I would then completely stress about everything around that to make sure it happened. And after doing this um, for a couple of weeks, I realized that this was really killing me. I wasn't sleeping. Work wasn't actually getting done because I was so worried about meeting deadlines and stuff. It was just absolutely killing me. But what had happened was I had taken my eyes off God. And I realized that I was actually looking at my customers to provide for my needs instead of God. And I needed to reset and to remember it's actually God that supplies all my needs. So since everyone in our business at that time was a believer, at the end of our daily huddle, we said, we're going to have a time of prayer. So every day we have a meeting, we stop and just talk about the, the things we're doing in the day. And at the end of that meeting, we commit that time to God. And uh, we commit our day to God. We ask for his help to solve the problems that we're working on. And we pray that he would give us this day our daily bread and supply our needs and for me that mental reset helps us stop stressing about the things that are outside our control and starts opening ourselves to the possibility that God is leading us in new ways and that he will provide for us it reminds us every single day it's actually God that provides our needs sure he's going to bring customers sure he's going to bring work in but we have to trust him and him alone first so at the start of my message, I said that the first talk in Emmaus was on about priorities. And that talk ends with three profound questions. What do you think about? Where do you spend your time? And where do you spend your money? And that is your priority. Now, if you apply that to your life right now, if you looked at what you think about and where you spend your time and where you spend your money, what's your priority? Is it God or is it something else? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you challenge us to not be content with where we are, but to constantly press into your presence. I thank you, Lord, for this word that challenges us to look at the things that we may have put above you. And in those places where we put something else as a priority, Father, we repent. And we confess that to you. And we just want to lay that down at the foot of your cross. And we pray, God, that you and you alone would be God in our lives. That you would be first and foremost. Father, we just ask for your forgiveness. For those times that we've set other things above you. 
that they are a higher priority. And instead, we want to put you once again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in our life. So Lord, would you enable us to do that? Would you help us to lay down those things? And as we choose to follow you, let our words and our actions be as one. As we seek to follow you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. You've taken a Bible passage that we're all very familiar with and probably read hundreds of times, and you've um, raised some very interesting questions and made it quite personal to us all to chew it over. Thank you. Right, now when the band's ready, we're going to join them by singing Take My Life and Let It Be. Again, quite relevant to the message this morning. <laughs> seated. We come to God talk. Has anyone seen God at work in their lives this week? Let us give thanks. <laughs> Gracious God, you are our provider and sustainer. We bring our gifts today mindful of your abundant love and mercy. As we offer these tithes and offerings, we ask that you remind us of the call to let go of our earthly attachments and follow you wholeheartedly. Bless these gifts and use them to further your kingdom on earth so that all may experience your grace and love. May our giving reflect our trust in you and our commitment to serve others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, Sal, can I call upon you now for the prayers of intercession? Right, we're going to stand and sing that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace.
Savior Jesus, is through, it is through you that we come to God. Do not let us be drawn away from you by the glitter of wealth or the burdens of daily concerns, but make us ready to leave everything and boldly follow you. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. May God bless you with courage to turn from the riches the world values, trust to choose God's economy over the world's economy, and opportunities to discover God's abundant grace over and over again. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. And please remain standing while Sal takes the scripture out before us as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. 